Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for um, attending this session organized by Marwa. I am uh, very appreciative of my invitation to speak to you this afternoon. For many years now, I have admired the work of your organization fighting and upholding the torch of freedom in Singapore. Now, I cannot agree more with uh, what Mr. Tan Kim Lian said before me. And uh, what a sea change the Malaysian election represented as far as human rights is concerned. I want to confine my address to you today to principally one of those human rights. And it is what I am passionately about. I am very passionate about it. And it is the freedom of speech. I do not address you as a human rights advocate. I have no right to call myself that. But I believe that the freedom of speech is not only a fundamental, hu fundamental human right, it is a human right which affects the quality of life. And I would like to lace my theme on this by telling you the story of two old men. Now, on the eve of the Malaysian elections, on the eve of polling, I heard Tun Mahathir speak to the whole nation. And he promised the nation that if elected, he will protect human rights and the right to free speech. And I was very heartened that two weeks ago, his new Attorney General, Tommy Thomas, a very illustrious uh, litigator, promised the Malaysian people when he took office that he would be promoting the freedom of speech. He wanted people to be able to criticize government. Now, I ask you this, and for many of you here, you are old enough, as I am, to remember Mahathir during his first tour of office in the 1980s, 1990s. Together with Lee Kuan Yew and President Suharto, they were the three strong men of Asia. Men who ran oppressive regimes, I would put it that way. Now why is it that suddenly, at the age of 92, in the winter of his life, this person has a change of heart and now advocates the protection of human rights and freedom of speech. I believe it is because after reflection and an experience of a lifetime, he came to realize this, that at the end of the day, a society needs freedom of speech in order for there to be creativity creativity. And you know his big nemesis, Lee Kuan Yew, said exactly the same thing. Although in the 80s, they both practiced the same arts. They suppressed freedom of speech. But a few years before he died, Lee Kuan Yew told three Harvard academics, China will never be as innovative and enterprising as America because in China, they do not have freedom of expression. There you have it. Here in Singapore today, we have ministers, we have the entire government telling us to be innovative. They throw money around. Last year, they said they're going to spend $19 billion over the next five years into R&D, innovation, and this and that. Why is it today, in ASEAN, Singapore is second last in the ranking for innovation efficiency output? What does that mean? It means, at the end of the day, we are not a creative society. We are not an innovative society. So. Don't allow the mainstream media and the government to tell you otherwise. We rank behind Malaysia, we rank behind Thailand, 
we rank behind Indonesia in terms of that index. And look at Indonesia. When Suharto fell, people thought the country was going to the dogs. All right, it will never recover. There was then an explosion of press freedom. Yeah. Today, in Indonesia, you can say anything. What you cannot say there is you cannot blaspheme Islam. All right? Like what the previous governor of uh, Jakarta found to his cause. But otherwise, you can criticize the government. You can do anything. As, and is Indonesia any worse off today? No. You find a re-energized Indonesia. An Indonesia that, according to the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey, by the year 2050, is going to be the fourth largest economy in the world. The first being China, obviously. Second, America. Third, India. Fourth, Indonesia. And by the way, these are all the fourth most populous countries in the world. But, so, freedom of expression will never lead to the destruction of a country. It leads to creativity. And America is the best example. America is the shining example of where freedom of speech reigns because of their so-called First Amendment in the Constitution, which guarantees free speech. But people don't realize this. In Singapore, we have that same freedom of speech in our Constitution. Although it is circumscribed by other laws like our defamation laws, sedition laws, and things like that. But we have that same guarantee in our Constitution. But we are a country that is fearful of speaking. And that has been to our cost. Why did that come about? It came about because of what I believe Lee Kuan Yew did in the 80s and the 90s, when he used the draconian defamation laws to persecute his political opponents, notably J.B. Giarana. And that fear percolated down into the psyche of the Singapore people. And today, you know, you go to the coffee shop, you may have a family sitting around to a meal, and then the children say something, and then the parents hush them up. Shh, don't say this. You can't have a people like that and be creative. Ultimately, what differentiates us from other animals is our ability to speak out. And for those more religiously minded, don't we find that example in scripture for the Christians? You only have to go to the first few pages of Genesis to realize that the way the Almighty created was He spoke first. You have to speak something first. I, I don't like to bring up this example, but it was Adolf Hitler who said, no movement has ever succeeded in history just through the written word. It has always been the spoken word. You speak and then things are created. And my friends, I address you at a time when Singapore is facing even great, greater restrictions on the freedom of speech. Very soon, I am sure once the Malaysian tsunami, the effect of the Malaysian tsunami has been diluted, you will find Mr. Shanmugam introducing fake news legislation, <laughs> something that Mr. Tan told us earlier the Malaysians have gotten rid of. And they are trying to tell us, look here, fake news is terrible. If we don't ban fake news, society is going to go to pieces. I say to this, total nonsense. All right? 
I thought it was very revealing at the select committee. You know who was the person who gave evidence, who was actually in the committee room the shortest period of time? Jonathan Wham, who was there for five minutes. And Jonathan Wham basically told the committee, what are you talking about? Show me an example. I, I'm not using his words, all right? I'm paraphrasing him. Show me an example where so-called fake news has actually caused damage to society. And of course you can't pinpoint any example, because there are none, all right? And so we have here a theoretical law trying to prevent harm to society. But you know what? As the very famous American judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court judge, judge once said, the life of the law is not logic. It is experience. So where is the experience here that we have experienced harm? And that brings me to my second story, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when I talk about the First Amendment, people think of America as a shiny example. And they think this freedom has always been there for Americans. But would you be shocked if I were to tell you that well into the 20th century, even until 1919, this freedom actually was not widely enjoyed by Americans. It was enshrined in their constitution, but Americans were regularly imprisoned for expressing political views, views contrary to what their government held. And then this amazing case called the United States against Abrams came to the Supreme Court for a decision. Abrams was a Russian Jew who had migrated to America. He and a group of friends threw out some leaflets from a block in New York. The first leaflet protested against the American government's support of the Russian government at that time. Russia was undergoing the Bolshevik Revolution, and they were in support of the revolution, and they were against the American government's uh, support of the government, of the Russian government. The second leaflet protested against America's involvement in the First World War, and they were charged for what we would today call sedition, trying to overthrow the government of the day. And they were convicted. And so they appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And on the court sat one of the most famous American judges of all time, Oliver Wendell Holmes. By then, he was 77 years of age. He had been a lifelong skeptic of individual rights. He had no time for people who wanted to express their political views. But after hearing arguments in court and over the summer before the court delivered his judgment, he read, he read extensively. He was influenced by many of his friends, including the famous professor Harold Lasky of the London School of Economics and other judges. And then he delivered a dissenting judgment. The court decided 7-2 in favor of the conviction. He was two of the dissenting members. He wrote a dissenting opinion, which has now become the cornerstone of First Amendment rights. So he, his, his dissenting opinion later turned into the law of the land. And I think it is a remarkable example of how an old man in the winter of his life again is able to learn, to advance, to change his way of thinking. And I want to read to you two passages of his judgment today because I think it is the approach Singapore must take towards the freedom of speech. And this is what he had to say. 
in one of the most famous passages of his judgment. Persecution for the expression of opinions seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. To allow opposition by speech seems to indicate that you think the speech impotent as when a man says that he has squared the circle or that you do not care wholeheartedly for the result or that you doubt either your power or your premises. What he said is so pertinent to us, isn't it? We have a government that passes try and get its way, all right? Because the law is supreme, we can't do anything about it. But it dare not, it dare not have a contest between truth and falsity. And Holmes went on to say, but when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths. They may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us allow the marketplace of ideas to be the arbiter of truth. Singapore is one of the most educated societies in the world. If you put a falsehood and the truth there side by side, I am confident Singaporeans will be able to discern what is truth, what is false. We do not need a tribunal. And let me ask you this. When the fake news legislation comes out, who is to be the arbiter of truth? And who is to be the arbiter of what is false? So, we need to change, my friends. You know, today, I say this with some confidence. What Tun Mahathir is doing is going to unleash the dormant genius, dormant potential of Malaysia. And Singaporeans and Malaysians are not that different. We are the same people. We have family and kin across the causeway. Today, 400,000 Malaysians work in Singapore. If we do not change our mindset, in 10 years' time, we may find 400,000 Singaporeans working in Malaysia. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.